So good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Talk Photography webinar, the first of a two-part parter that we're going to do with David, and then we'll talk about uh, his miniature world at another time. David, how are you, my friend? I'm fine, thanks. How are you doing, Jim? I'm good, mate. I know well, we know we're okay because we've been having a chat, but it's always very <laughs> nice to uh, to check. David, it's really good. This is your first, obviously, webinar with us. And as, as I said earlier, you've been in the mag. Well, I didn't know if you knew that it'd gone live today, but you're in the magazine again today. Which I presume yeah, that's is that is that on light painting today? Because I didn't have a chance to have a look, to be honest. That's what on light painting, sorry, Jim. Is the article that's gone in this month's is that about your light painting? It's something to do with time. It is. Yeah. It is, yeah, because because, because the issue is about time. Obviously, light painting is all about this art of distilling images through through long exposure. So it felt quite relevant. Yeah, no, it's perfect. And when I saw it, because I literally got given it a couple of hours ago when on a finish for the weekend, um, and it was like, I must get it up li online today because Mark does his web blast and his e his emails. So it was yeah. just like, I saw you it listed and I saw it was time. So presumed it was the light painting because obviously we've already done uh, the miniature world. Where you had, had the cover recently. Uh, David, look, thrilled to have you on board. Uh, I feel like I've known you forever and we've only chatted a couple of times, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, but just for obviously the people that are with us tonight, um, just give us a little bit of an insight into, yeah, you because know, I know it wasn't always full time photography. I know you've moved over it to, over to it now, and uh, um, and how you kind of got into it, and and what you're all about, mate. Sure. Okay. We'll start with that kind of slightly less exciting part, and I'll give you a very quick summary of of my background. So um, I'm based up here in, in Glasgow in Scotland, and around 20 years ago, um, I completed my fine art photography degree at the Glasgow School of Art. And then made the very logical move after completing a degree in fine art photography to move down to the Channel Islands where I lived in Guernsey for 14 years and somehow found myself being kind of sucked into the world of offshore finance. Do not ask me how that happens, <laughs> um, but it did. Um, and I returned to Scotland just over four years ago um, and decided two, two and a half years ago uh, to take the bold kind of plunge into the uh, full time world of photography and became a professional photography um, and artist. And during my time at art school, that's when I specialized and learned all about this fascinating world of miniatures, which is where my kind of uh, miniature world and small world work is born um, born out of. And then a bit later on, um, during my time in Guernsey, which I'll, I'll come to when we look at some of the images shortly, um, I did get back into my photography, even during my time working down there. Um, that's when my journey into light painting began about 10, 11 years ago. Um, and that's what tonight's all about. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. As I said, we're going to talk about, uh, obviously, how people can get and interact with you a bit f uh, in more detail and, and your ebooks uh, after the presentation. But we won't waste any time, uh, David, because I'm as eager to share with them what you have for them. So let me make you the presenter, mate. So okay. it should be prompting you, and then it'll ask you to share your screen, and I'll let you know. Well, there we go. So I'm seeing, uh, yeah, seeing your desktop full screen. Thank you very much, and thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, and likewise, Jay, we've only spoken twice or maybe three times, I think, and I feel like I know you pretty well already as well. Okay, so image number one, you should be able to see a kind of moody seascape, um, which I captured in Guernsey. And the reason we'll start with some more regular kind of landscape work for this uh, for tonight's seminar is because this will help kind of explain my journey into light painting um, throughout the slideshow. So as I mentioned, I, I found myself living down in Guernsey uh, some time ago. I lived there for 14 years, just, at, just after my photography degree. And about four or five years after my, my, um, my life in Guernsey, I had a very strong creative itch to get back to my photography, which had kind of dropped by the wayside for a few years. And having worked in a Guernsey office, a financial institution for many years, I was constantly surrounded by photographs on the walls of the boardrooms and the office itself of lovely, beautiful landscape images that had been captured by other artists and photographers from the Channel Islands. And every single office I subsequently went into for meetings and so on uh, had the same. They were all plastered in these lovely landscape images. And this, these images, it felt like they frequently kind of taunted me to get back to my photography because that's where, where my interests had initially lied. And so I decided I had to get back to photography. And of course, something scary had happened between leaving art school and that point in time where everything had gone digital pretty much. Um, I was trained quite classically using film cameras. And so I kind of hesitated initially to get back 
into my photography because it felt very much like learning it from scratch. But that's what I did. And I decided to use these other images that, I, like I say, I was surrounded by on a daily basis as a kind of inspiration for at least learning how to get back to photography to a level that I was happy with. And that became my entry point, if you like. Um, I was always quite keen on landscape photography anyway. And I decided that I would start to create images that were hopefully quite similar to those that I was seeing on a daily basis by other professionals. But I didn't want to start showing that work and make myself all about capturing those kind of images because that work was all already well and truly uh, being captured and, um, and and exhibited on the island because of the, like I say, all the other landscape photographers that were already doing so. So I wanted to get into landscape photography, but do something a bit more unique uh, through my imagery. And that's how my journey into light painting evolved over time. So you'll notice probably as you look at some of these more regular looking landscape images and seascapes, um, they're all captured using long exposure photography. I very rarely went out with my with my camera handheld and and captured the landscape as as you perceive it uh, through the through the naked eye. I was more interested in this notion of condensing time and having the image represent a time period. So even this image that we're looking at, which was uh, captured in broad daylight, very sunny day as you can see, was shot using a, a tripod and uh, it's called the big stop. It was a, it's an ND filter which allows me to slow down my exposures even in the daytime. So I was always, always, an, already by that point, and always have been interested in, in long expo exposure photography. We'll just sort of crack on few, through a few of these, and you'll, you'll always be able to see details, whether it be in the sea or the sky, that kind of, that kind of giveaways um, about the, the long exposure nature of, of what I've been up to. You can normally see the clouds dragging across the sky or the sea turning into that kind of lovely, that kind of milky effect. Uh, which is what happens during a, a long exposure, of course, when the, when the water is being churned around. So this gives me a little chance to show you a little bit of Guernsey, at least. Um, it's a very beautiful island. Um, again, another very long exposure, probably a few minutes, capturing sunrise. All very typical kind of postcard images. And once I'd got to a level of, of being a photographer at the time that I was happy with, and I, was, I, fe I felt I was capturing the landscape and seascape images to a similar standard of those that I was seeing others producing who were doing this full time. I felt like I kind of mastered my journey back to photography, uh, albeit with a digital camera this time around. That was kind of how I used my landscape work at that time. And then, of course, this is a more typical image that represents the passing of time. So you've, you've all no doubt seen images before of star trail photography, where you set the, the camera running on a very long exposure. And through aiming the lens or directing the lens towards the, the North Star or Pol Polaris, as it's also called, um, you'll get the, the, this lovely swirling effect of the, of the stars motioning around that central point. And so this is, this is, I mean, star trail photography is, in essence, light painting in a way. The stars are doing all the hard work for you, of course. But I was yet to discover at that point in time just how hands-on a process light painting can be. Um, and we'll get to that in just a short while. Again, another more typical kind of example of a light painting image. Everyone should be quite familiar with, with car light trail photography and car light trail imagery, where the photographer set the, again, set the, the camera running on a long or longish exposure, and the car light trails kind of um, freeze into the image during, during the long exposure in the darkness. So again, a nice kind of, uh, Simple example, if you like, of getting our heads around what a light painting image looks like. And I then found myself uh, venturing out later and later in the evening um, and, and got to the point where I was starting to influence my surroundings by, by using things like torchlight. So I would illuminate objects in space um, to help bring out the detail or brickwork. As you can see, this is, this is called a Martello Tower. I'm in that image just as a kind of example image, but I would, I would normally stand off to the side and illuminate objects in space um, during during a long exposure to help uh, accentuate the detail um, within the landscape. So again, that's a very nice example of light painting in terms of using light to uh, to influence the shot from outside the frame. And again, this is a very subtle example of light painting. One one of my favourite shots in terms of landscape that I, that I captured. And you won't be able to tell it maybe from initially looking at it, but if you see that kind of dappled 
light that's kind of entering the image from the right hand side that's kind of running across the sand that's that's actually me just off camera just just to the right of the frame they are standing waving a torch quite low to the ground and just picking out the detail in the sand and illuminating these wooden posts um again another kind of for the purposes of this evening another useful example of light painting that's not overly intrusive because i'm stood outside the frame and i'm using the light to help like I say, influence influence the uh, the features within the landscape and the landscape itself. Now, this is a really important image to me, um, and I'll explain why. This is the only image I think that I'm going to show you guys tonight that's not an image that I captured. Um, this was an image that I encountered around the time, just, just after that previous shot you see, um, captured by a friend of mine on the island called Simon Campbell. And... I remember seeing this image for the first time and just staring at it and wondering how on earth it had been captured and what on earth was I looking at. And I had a quick word of them and he explained to me that the rings of light around all of the wooden posts were created by him walking into the shop during a long exposure and moving a torch around each of the pillars. And that just blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind at the time. I, I just remember thinking, well, that's that's magic. Um, and light painting is such a beautiful and magic magical process when you when you start to kind of discover what uh, the, what's ca what you're capable of during during a long exposure and, and moving around different light sources. So this image was my entry point, if you like, into the world of light painting. And after I saw this image, uh, that was me, hook, line, and sinker. And so I did what any budding photographer did. And as I kind of did with my landscape work a little bit as well, I thought, well, what I'll do to begin with is I'll try to kind of replicate what Simon's done in this shot. And I'll have a go myself, not having a clue how it will turn out. So I got a very simple and cheap uh, pen torch, headed back to, to that site that we were just looking at um, at night time after the sun had set, and very carefully stood behind each of the posts, moving the torch around the front of the pillar, back to the other hand, and repeated that process numerous times for each of the posts, creating this rather kind of surreal effect. And it was at this point, once I'd created my first light painting, that I realized this process was doing precisely what I wanted it to do for me. And that was having having been kind of saturated, if you like, from having looked at so many landscape images captured by other photographers, I was desperate to present the landscape to the viewer um, in a completely different fashion. And light painting, ever since this day, which was nearly 12 years ago, has allowed me to do that. So I'm able to influence the shots and add features or add light to it that kind of challenge the viewer. Uh, it kind of makes them pause and wonder what on earth they're looking at and how it's been created. And the one thing I'll mention earlier on in this talk this evening is all of my light paintings that we'll look at this evening have all been created uh, pretty straightforwardly. There's, there's no real trick, trickery going on. I want to make that clear. I don't own or use Photoshop. Um, it, all the light paintings are created organically by, by me walking into the shot and moving around different light sources. Um, and I was quite fortunate on this particular evening because halfway through this exposure, which I planned to be about eight minutes long, the heavens absolutely opened a bit like they did today. And, um, and, and it really started raining heavily. So I had to grab my camera while it was still running uh, on the back of my tripod and stuff under my jacket and, and hot leg it back to the car. Uh, only to discover once I got back to the car that the exposure was actually pretty decent. That's the exposure that we're looking at right now. So I'd actually completely misjudged how long um, the exposure should should be and through kind of a bit of a happy mistake um, got this resulting image and that's a nice kind of um, a nice point to make really at this early stage of showing you some of the light painting work light painting is very experimental and I implore anyone that gives this a, a proper go don't be afraid of making mistakes I have made plenty um, over the last 11-12 years I promise you and uh, sometimes the mistakes can yield really really interesting results so just before we lead into the next section of images, there's just a couple more here for this first part. I just want to talk about the process of light painting itself. You don't need to fix the camera onto a tripod to run a long exposure and get, uh, get results and create light paintings. There is another way of doing it, which I don't tend to use too often, but this is an interesting example to show you at least. You can actually hand, hand hold the camera and point it at a light source. So the image we're looking at right now is just me uh, focusing the camera on some street lights, setting it to a long exposure, and then manually moving the camera itself up and down to create this rather abstract kind of messy effect. 
Um, but of course, when you attach the camera to a tripod and are able to physically enter the space that's been captured, then you can create far more refined effects, I think. And again, just coming back to this notion of, of light painting and freezing light into space uh, using time uh, and a, a long exposure, just want to make sure at this early point that all the listeners are grasping the concept because that's quite important for tonight. So think, think back to images you've seen, seen before, like car light trails. Um, where the camera has uh, been left running and cars have rushed through the shot. The, the lights, because they are obviously much brighter than the car itself, have frozen into the image and the car has, uh, has, has driven through the image and remains completely invisible. That is exactly what's happening to me as a photographer and you, if you try this uh, during the long exposure, as long as you dress in dark clothing, you keep moving and don't illuminate yourself with a light source, you will remain invisible, which is quite a beautiful it's quite a beautiful process. And like I say, it's, it's magical what you can achieve using uh, just some lights during a long exposure. And I think this is the final image of, of this folder. This is my wife just giving a, a very quick demonstration with a sparkler. We've all waved a sparkler around in Guy Fawkes night, haven't we, in trying to spell our name out or done spirals. And again, coming back to this kind of initial explanation of how the process works, the human eye can only momentarily perhaps pick out um, a light source moving around, it'll burn into the retina, into your retina a little bit when you when you move a sparkler around in the in the night sky. Because a camera is running on a long exposure, it will pick up every single movement of the light source. Um, so you know if you can imagine yourself walking along with a sparkler and writing an entire sentence out in the in, in the in the night sky, your camera will pick up every letter, um, unlike what your eye is capable of doing. So I think this is why I love the process so much. The images represent the passing of time and the light that you'll see in the images we come on to shortly represent me moving through space um, and the remnants that are left behind are only the lights. You, you very rarely see me in my, my photographs, which I quite enjoy. And Jay, we'll come back to you very quickly if you're still there. Um, I am indeed. The the if there's any questions um, at this stage, fire away. There's one relevant question. There's a couple of questions, some that I'll hang on to, but one that I guess was relevant that came in quite early, David, when you were showing yeah. the first examples uh, of the light painting. Um, we, mm -hmm. we can see, well, I'm guessing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, obviously we're seeing images that um, you're clearly waiting till it's darker, but there's some that seem to be sort of, you know, just before sunset or around that time. Um, am I am I right in thinking that, that you you can still do the light painting when there is some light still in the sky? It's a, it's a very good question, and we will come on to that and cover it in a bit more detail shortly. But yes, you can you can light paint as the light is fading. Um, darkness is required. So if you try to light paint a bit too early on after sunset, when there's still a, a large amount of ambient light around, you'll probably find if you're not using an incredibly bright light source that the light painting will look very faded, and it'll eventually just look very washed out. Um, so I tend to go light painting um, sometime after the the sun has set it tends to change depending on the time of year of course yeah um i very rarely go light painting when it's pitch black there's an interesting one for you i, I like to light paint between anywhere between a half moon and a full moon because the, that little bit of ambient light that the, is given off by the moon or um, sometimes it's a lot of light that the moon produces really helps to expose the surrounding landscape um which for me is really important to my images because when i when i teach light painting to other photographers it's one of the first things I try to get them to grasp, and that is before you get carried away with the light painting element of the image, it's important to capture the landscape, how you want it to appear in the light painting image itself. Um, and so I always, we'll look at that shortly when I show you a small tutorial, but I always make sure that I expose for the landscape first and then add the light painting um, second, second to that. Brilliant. So the, the question that sort of just spurred, spurred what I just asked there, was there a difference in exposure for day versus night? But I wanted to clear that, but I knew that it was closer to nighttime and, and darkness that you were that you were shooting. Yeah. So I know we're going to talk about those. So um, I'll hang on to everything else I got for a minute. David, you crack on, mate. OK, I will do. Thank you. So we're going to look at some tools now and the effects created using them. So I'll just pause my slideshow with any luck it will behave itself so i won't explain in great detail what we're looking at right now because there's a lot going on there but this is this is um i guess this represents most of the light painting tools that i use and as you can see there's all sorts of bizarre looking gadgets um in this image 
but I kind of want to convey again at this earliest point that you know there is a plethora of uh, of objects and tools and portable gadgets you can use to go light painting with. And it's it's been a really interesting journey for me over the last uh, twelve or so years into light painting, as as this um, as we find ourselves in the digital photography era, light painting has evolved rapidly as a process. And um, back when I was started to light paint, and it's important actually at this point as well to point out that light painting is is by no means a new process. Um, if anyone on on this uh, on this webinar might might already know, but you know artists like Picasso and Man Ray dabbled with light painting. It's been around for decades. It's not a new concept. But I think digital photography has offered the photographer a lot more control over how they go light painting, especially because you can you can see the results in the back of your, ca your camera uh, instantaneously, and you can delete and go again, or you can see the results pretty much immediately after you're finished and then have another attempt to maybe tidy something up or do something a bit different. Um, so digi digital photography has has meant that a lot of light painters, as we seem to be known, um, have actually created their own bespoke light painting tools now, um, which I'll maybe talk talk a bit more about either at the end of this this talk this evening, or or in the the second seminar next Wednesday. Um, but yeah, th this image represents a, a a bizarre and quite lovely collection of of tools ranging from very very cheap finger LEDs that I buy on Amazon or eBay, which are just pennies to buy. To miniature lightsaber or key rings, glow sticks, and then we find ourselves kind of going through things like lightsabers, and then a lot of the stuff towards the bottom of the screen. These kind of weird, kind of blade-shaped instruments. They are actually crafted by a light painter, and they're called light blades. There's a lot of other things in this image, but I just want to show that to kind of convey this idea that there is a, a very broad range of tools you can go light painting with that all create different effects. Um, a very quick look at the camera gear I can use. Some people are interested in this, some people aren't. But very quickly, I use a Canon 5D Mark III currently. Uh, I've used much more basic gear than that in the past. I think I started with a Canon 1000D, which was very entry level, very basic. And funny enough, some of my favourite light painting work was was captured using that camera. I think some people get a little bit obsessed with um, with uh, you know megabytes and pixels and so on. Um, as long as your camera's not creating a really nasty amount of noise, um, you're good to go. You don't need to use expensive equipment, but you will need a tripod and you will need a, a cable release um, or something to that effect for starting and stopping your exposures. Those are the three, three really, really important bits of gear. Your camera and the lens, of course. I use a relatively wide angle lens. My favourite lens is in that shot. I think it's a 24mm uh, prime lens, tripod and cable release. Those are the essentials. And then a very quick look at, look at a few of the torches that I use. I've got a very, I've got a pretty vast collection of torches, as you can perhaps imagine. Torches are important for several reasons. Um, we'll, we'll go back into this in a bit more detail when we were in talk number two, uh, presentation number two. But for now, I, I always, uh, at any given point when I've got my my camera bag with me, we'll have a couple of different torches in there. One that's really powerful and one that's a little less powerful. Torches are important, uh, like I say, for several reasons. One, just for safety's sake, because you're going to be out there at night time. You want to find your way around in the dark safely. Two, you may want to actually use the, the torch for illuminating the landscape itself, um, which I've done from time to time in some of my, my outdoor shots. And, and three, it, they're quite handy for looking at the back of the camera when it's pitch black and you're looking at your camera settings and so on. Um, and they can be used for actual light painting into the image itself um, also like I showed you a bit earlier with a couple of the early example shots. So let's rattle through a few of the tools um, just to get you familiar with some of the some of the tools that I use and certainly all of these tools feature in my workshops. This stuff is called L-Wire, Electroluminescent Wire is its full name and it comes with a little battery pack. It's very cheap. I think you can buy a packet of, of eight of them as shown in this image for something like 20 quid, pretty cheap. Um, and all of the little battery packs just plug into each of the colours. And the idea is that you kind of jiggle this stuff around during the long exposure in front of the camera lens, and it creates this kind of effect. Um, this, this particular image was captured during one of my, my light painting workshops, and you've got four people stood holding a pose in front of the camera, and there was another four people that walked into the shop during the exposure and stood behind each of the individuals and waved around a different colour of L wire behind each person. Um, helping kind of silhouette them. Here's L wire and it's all its glory, just just on its own. No people, 
being illuminated or, or silhouetted in this shot. This is just L wire being waved around all different colours in a rather large gym hall with lots of things. Um, creates a lovely kind of wispy effect, and it sometimes reminds me as well of, of what happens to the sea or you know waves and water during a long exposure. It creates this kind of lovely, kind of floaty, misty, kind of ethereal effect. And here's me taking the L wire outdoors into the landscape and kind of coating coating the ground in it, creating this kind of eerie kind of ghostly effect. L wire is great fun. You can use it for all different kind of kinds of purposes. So these little things are called finger LEDs. Again, very cheap and cheerful. You can buy these. I think I mentioned a bit earlier on on eBay or Amazon. They they are pennies, or if not, maybe a pound or two. They're really cheap. Um, I use finger LEDs sometimes for hand drawing lettering or, or kind of fine lines into my light painting work, or I'll actually attach them to, to a device that I've created that I spin around uh, for creating orbs. And these are orbs here, these kind of um, three dimensional uh, floating balls of light, as they've also been come, come to be known as. In fact, there's a good time to mention them. One of my good friends, there's another chap, if any of you fancy looking up another light painter who is absolutely mastered uh, the art of creating obs. Um, he's called Dennis Smith, Dennis with one N. He's a, he's a masterful light painter. There's someone you should go and look up as well. And when I was in Guernsey, just coming back to this image, actually, I, I used to love heading down to this area here called the outdoor bathing pools. Uh, this became a bit of a testing ground for me. Uh, whenever I had a new idea or a new tool that I wanted to test out, I would often take it down here next to the water's edge and have a bit of a play. Um, something quite magical happens when you add light painting and water and you get the reflections as well. Um, so just to explain what's, what's going on here, because I, I kind of went through this earlier. Um, you can, if you look in the sky, you'll actually see the stars trailing across the sky. They, they kind of represent the passing of time. That's a nice way of, of, uh, of, of discovering that, you know, what, what sort of length of exposure we're looking at here. This is probably a four or five, six minute long shot, something like that, which is allowing me the time to walk into the shot, spin around the lights to create one of these these orbs, and then I've used a different light source, a different color of light LED, finger LEDs to to spin to spin the second orb, and then I've walked out of the shot and let the rest of the exposure finish to make sure that the uh, the landscape exposes uh, sufficiently as well. And this is up in this is up in Scotland in the Outer Hebrides in the Isle of Lewis. I've I've always loved this notion or idea of, of uh, going light painting within a structure of standing stones and finally got my opportunity a couple of years ago in amongst some rather heavy hailstone showers. Um, but yeah, majestic, majestic sight and quite a magical place to go light painting. If you look at the bottom of that image, just the bottom of the orb where it's been spun, you can see a couple of slightly dark kind of lines coming down from the orb. Can you see that? Just kind of a dark silhouette. That's actually me. And I did mention earlier that I don't particularly choose to appear in my photographs. I quite enjoy the fact that the light freezes into the image and becomes a kind of floating sculpture, if you like. But you will, from time to time, see slight evidence of me being in the shots. And that is one particular instance there where you can just see my legs starting to ghost into the image. Now, this is one of my favorite tools. It comes with a, a small kind of caveat, I'm afraid. This, this thing's called a lens or V24. And it changes color, as you can see in the packet there. It kind of cycles through seven different colors. These things are really difficult to get hold of now. It's basically a metal handle that you fill up with batteries to power it. And it's got an acrylic rod that attaches onto the, the top end. And the, the little um, the bulbs inside the, the instrument sort of uh, shine up through the acrylic to create this lovely kind of evenly lit uh, acrylic rod. It's very much just a posh lightsaber. So if you want to try something similar to this, um, grab yourself a, a lightsaber toy. It will create very similar results. And here's a, a really simple, this is one of my simplest light painting images. And strangely, one of my most effective, I think. Um, I like to use in my presentations. And what, what you're looking at here is me standing at the back of the shot, at the far, the far kind of back right edge of the, of the brickwork there. And I've used a lightsaber and it switched on and swept it kind of through the space and then down that little hatch in the floor. I've then switched. The, uh, that tool off, come back behind my camera and actually used a very rarely do this, but I actually used a flash gun uh, and fired the flash gun once just to illuminate the brickwork in this little kind of, it's actually a little fishing hut where people stored crab pots and stuff. 
um, really simply made, and I think the exposure length was something like 30, 40 seconds long, really short and sweet. Laser pointers, I'm not sure how much I encourage people to, to play around with these too much for obvious reasons, but um, I have dabbled with them just to kind of see what kind of effect they, they make. And this ne next image is quite an interesting example of, of what happened. So I was stood behind the camera at the edge of the shoreline and shone a, a laser pointer into the water and something very weird, like I said earlier, some really weird stuff happens when you go light painting sometimes that you just don't expect. The laser pointer, instead of just illuminating the rocks, which was my plan, actually kind of refracted upwards because the rocks were wet, creating this kind of really strange kind of glowing kryptonite effect. This is just a real cheap old torch that I bought on eBay that came with a set of little color torch filters, um, which are really useful, really fun to use because you can just attach these little stoppers to the end of the torch uh, to create different colors and you can start to literally color in objects in space using the different torch filters. Here's a kind of weird, probably an old German structure left over, one of the remnants from World War II in Guernsey that I've just kind of, uh, I've colored in using different, different color filters. Right, this is quite nice. This, this, this stuff does come with a warning, actually. This is quite, um, a lot of people that get into light painting early on uh, enjoy using this stuff, but it can burn you. So just be careful. This is called steel wool or wire wool. And the idea is you, you might recognize it from something you used for, for scrubbing plates with or cleaning with. Somebody discovered a while back that this stuff actually burns quite well. Don't ask me how. They obviously held a lighter up to it and something weird happened, but this stuff kind of burns quite slowly. It kind of, um, it just kind of slowly ebbs away with a very small kind of, um, what do you even call it, a flame, the kind of cinders. And if you stuff wire wool or steel wool in a whisk um, and then spin it around when it's, when it's been uh, when it's been set alight, you can create some really quite dramatic uh, effects, as you'll see in the next image. So you can actually see me quite clearly in this image, standing in the middle of the um, that ring of fire, if you like. And uh, I've just been spinning around this this steel wheel inside the whisk after lighting it during a long exposure um, on a beach, because that felt like one of the safer places to do this. You don't want to be setting anything alight. Um, and yeah, it's just like a giant Catherine wheel, really. Um, but I've, I've heard some some truly horrifying stories of people using this stuff. Um, one one guy in the US burnt, burnt down a listed building, I think, because um, he went inside and spun this around and something caught a light. So just be careful if you're using it. Always wear a hat is my suggestion and maybe even safety goggles as well. And think about where you're using it. Sparkers, here's another really easy thing to get a hold of. Um, as mentioned earlier, you know, you can you can draw lettering with these or just run around and create all sorts of weird lines in space. Um, here's a rather random example image I've got of something I did with. I, just, I like the sculpture and decided to draw around the sculpture uh, with the sparkler as an outline using a long exposure, of course. Now, this is a really interesting one. So talking about light painters earlier and the tools that they have now started crafting, light painters have become really creative uh, nowadays in terms of the tools that they make. And this chap that came up with this idea initially was called and is called Andrew White. And he decided to experiment with a, an old BMX wheel uh, to which he attached some some fairy lights and added uh, this, this rod through an, an axle through the, the middle of the wheel. And the idea being that something quite interesting is going to happen when you set this wheel spinning in the dark, um, which we'll move on to now. Quite a beautiful effect and quite unexpected in some ways. But it creates this lovely kind of chrysalis, this kind of crisscross dome of light. Um, and of course, if you switch the lights off and then place it again and, and set it spinning again, you can create multiple what are called domes, domes of light uh, coming out the ground. Very beautiful. And this is a slightly different process that we'll, we'll touch upon tonight as well. These, the things that you're going to see in a, in a moment, the results of, of this device spinning around are called physiograms, and they're really easy to try at home. So this is just a very small, uh, homemade LED that I've kind of weighted and I'm hanging it from the ceiling. That's the ceiling at the top of the image. I've just stuck stuck the um, the string securely to the ceiling with a big lump of blue tack, or you can use a cup hook. And <clears throat> the idea is that the camera is going to be set running in the dark. The exposure is going to be set running, but the camera is going to be facing up at the hanging light source that's hanging from the ceiling. And the beauty of this process is the um, the photographer only has so much say in what's going to actually happen. Gravity does a lot of hard work for you. And if you imagine the lights being switched off 
and that tiny little LED being switched on in the dark, when it's spinning, this is the kind of effect that it creates. Um, and what's happening here, the reason you can see several different colors is because I've, I've quite simply changed the color of the, of the LED um, by sellotaping different quality street sweet wrappers to the, uh, to the end of the light, because the, it's a nice little tip, this for light painters, quality street sweets, um, the ones that are covered in those little uh, colored, colored wrappers, they make great little miniature gels that you can change the, uh, the color of a light source with. Um, so there's a nice, nice excuse for you to get eating sweets. Right, bit of a rubbish shot, this one, it's stolen from my website. This is a, a sort of distance, or I should say close-up shot of something called a pixel stick. Um, so again, this is a tool that's actually been created by light painters for light painters. And this little box you're looking at, which is in the, placed in the middle of two rather long sections of the tool, actually is able to carry a small SD card to which you can upload images onto, and then you can actually light paint the images into space. Um, I know that probably sounds uh, rather strange and rather surreal, but I'll kind of talk you through the process. So it's, it's a two meter long pole that's got LEDs from top to bottom on it. And as you just saw at the very side of the pole, it's got an SD card. And I and many other light painters, whoever buys it, you can upload your own images into the pixel stick. And when the lights start firing, uh, the idea is that you walk through the image while the lights are firing at different speeds and intervals. And it will literally create the light painting of the image that you have stored in the SD card. It's, it's a very peculiar and quite quite breathtaking process when you see it happening for the first time. So I uploaded a couple of images of T-Rex onto the, uh, the pixel stick and then light painted them into a landscape. So what you're seeing hasn't been superimposed into the photograph. Those, uh, those light paintings were actually created on, on location. Here's a slightly prettier image, again using the pixel stick. And you can see the, the light kind of reflecting, I always like this, the, the light reflecting in the water, which kind of shows, it helps kind of prove the physical presence, if you like, of the light in the space during, during the exposure. And glow sticks, another very cheap and easy to access tool that you can buy online for pennies. Um, glow sticks are, are a lot of fun to use. Um, I, I often use the glow sticks in, in my workshops and Here's, here's a really rough example image of, of just that happening. So a handful of people, uh, students during one of my classes standing hand in hand. And what I've asked them to do is using a different color of glow stick, they've all stood there and used their bodies as a template over which they've uh, rubbed the glow stick. So they've literally colored themselves in, if you like. And, um, and the, the end result is that they end up looking like kind of glowing little stick people. And here's a slightly brighter image, maybe a bit too bright, but again, a much more uh, a bigger effort, if you like, using the same concept. So this was this was one of my friend's ideas. A guy called Kevin. He wanted a few of us photographers to meet at the outdoor, well, at the, at the, at the football pitch, and place ourselves in the football stands. And um, we all chose a row of seats each, and armed with a few glow sticks in our pockets, we tried to kind of um, replicate some football fans in the stadium. Quite a bizarre idea, but it, we just about pulled it off. Quite a ghostly looking image. And I think back to you, G. If you've got any other questions, we've just finished folder number two. Okay, but yeah, um, we do. Uh, again, a couple that are sort of more generic. I'll hang on to, but uh, I'll ask these while they're fresh in the mind. Um, okay. Going back to the stone, uh, I think you said it was in the in Scotland. You know, the one that you were really pleased yeah. with, where we saw your legs. Um, just a, a couple of people have asked us to give us an idea of how long the exposure actually is, David, on the, some of these shots. Sure. So, so my exposures tend, I, I probably couldn't tell you off the top of my head for every shot what the exact exposure length was, but they all tend to vary somewhere behind, so somewhere between about four and six minutes. Depend, it's all dependent on how much ambient light uh, is around in the, in the night sky. Um, that particular night, I remember it being very cloudy, very dark um, and very stormy, actually. As I said, there was a few hailstone showers we had to wait, pa wait on passing. So that would have been a longer exposure for that very reason. Um, but yeah, the exposures tend to be minutes, minutes long, very rarely anything longer than about seven or eight minutes um, and normally longer than three or four, something like that. So between about four and six minutes for most, most of my light paintings, it, uh, unless I maybe point out like I did earlier, you know, a really short light painting was the one we looked at with the, um, you know, the ribbon in the, uh, in the archway. Uh, let me just 
find where that is again. Here it is here. This was one of my shortest ever light paintings, very, very short and sweet. I think it was about 30 seconds, um, but they're normally a few minutes long at least. Brilliant. Okay. So that great. Actually, we were just about to ask you about that one. Well, I, a couple of people asked, I and mean, just to make it clear, it, going back to that image as well is, is an example mm -hmm. of it. Um, these images, they're, they're one exposures. You're not, you're not stacking images, are you? Oh, no, no, never, never stacking anything. No. So <clears throat> as I've become a bit more established and well-known within the kind of light painting kingdom, if you like, the, there's a few of us that have been light painting, um, online and kind of comparing results and chatting in forums for, like I say, maybe 12 or something years. And yeah, this, this is something we kind of, we tend to pride ourselves on a little bit. Some people do upload um, light paintings where they've maybe taken an exposure of a landscape and then they've made a light painting and superimposed or stacked it on top of it. Um, I, I never do that. I personally feel that a lot of the skill involved in light painting and to call something genuinely a light painting, it should be physically made within the space that's being captured. So every single image you, you will see of mine and that we look at tonight was captured using a, a single long exposure and involved me walking into the space and moving one of these different light sources around. So if we stick with this for a second. Um, yeah. So you said it was obviously one of your short exposures, but how many times yeah. would you say that you, so it, it, when, you, when you're out on a shoot, how many times would you have taken this, do you think? On average, S several. Um, so I, I can remember this evening very well. Actually, I think this was maybe maybe f effort number five or six. Um, I couldn't get the line to look exactly how. I mean, it looks it's quite a dynamic shape that I've created in this image. I remember wanting the line to to look kind of foreshortened and like it was more twisting around. And yeah, I tried I tried three or four different um, place points within that space to move the light through that just didn't look uh, impressive enough. So yeah, I just I just kept repeating the process until I I nailed the shot the way I wanted it. Brilliant. And this one, uh, let's see if I'm paying attention. I hope I am. This was the tool where the color adjusted for you through the swipe, wasn't it? This was the one that changed the color. Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's called a. It's a bit of a mouthful. It's called a, an LED lens or V twenty four. Quite a robotic okay. name. It's it's basically a basically a posh color changing lightsaber device. Um, and yeah, you can and you can see every every light painting tool that I use will have a different quality to it because of the the depth or the width or the shape of the tool. And you can see this is quite a literal line that it's drawn using the width of that acrylic rod that we looked at earlier. Yeah. So the width of the tool has created the width of the line. Yeah, and I know we won't jump back and forth now, but where you've shown different colours, um, you've just used either different torches or changed the colour of your device within the exposure itself. Does that make sense? Exactly. Yeah, it, it does. Yep. So I'll, I'll sometimes add a gel to the end of my torch to to co help color in the landscape, but um, I don't do that very often. The, the colors that you see in in a lot of the the images that I'm showing you tonight are just created by the color of the the tool that I've used. So you know, a, a colorful glow stick or a different color of L wire, um, and so on, or a different series of LEDs that I've used um, with different colors. So I very rarely kind of inter interfere too much with the color of the, the tools that I'm using, unless, like I say, it's maybe a, just a, a plain old torch that I've decided to, to modify to, to omit a different color. So in this last batch of questions, there's still more, but I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to hang on to the more generic ones to, for the question yeah. section. But the, the one where you showed the example that you did in your living room from the ceiling and the little LED, and then you were talking about the quality street wrappers. That's just yeah. one long exposure, and you're literally swapping the wrapper and then spinning, spinning it again. Exactly, and you know that's whoever whoever picked up on that. That's a really, really um, interesting one to pick up on, and, and very eagle-eyed of you because yes, it, the answer is yes. It's a single long exposure. Everything is, but the reason I've been able to add the different colours um, is because what I've done is once I've set the light spinning, say using the green light. Once the LED has almost come to a resting point, I've put the lens cap back on the lens while it's still running. I've then changed in the dark using a head torch, uh, the color of the, you know, the cellophane wrapper on the end of the LED, put a different color on it, set it spinning again, taking the lens cap off the camera and allowed, allowed that light source to burn into the image again. And then just repeated that process several times. Brilliant. Brilliant. Mate. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, right. I'm going to hang on to the rest because it's more generic and I want to get the key part because obviously people can stay online okay. with us for the questions anyway, but uh, sure. Sure. let's make sure we cover the core of it, mate. But brilliant. Thanks.
No problem. So we'll move on to the, the, the there's two more folders. This one's a bit shorter, um, but it's an important one. Um, let's just start the slideshow and I'll pause it. So, okay, this, this is a bit of a, a kind of mini tutorial, if you like. This will help you guys kind of get your heads around the, the process itself, um, which is really important to me because I want to make sure that I'm, I'm helping you guys uh, equip yourselves as best you can to go light painting. So bulb mode on a, on a traditional DSLR camera is really important because, as a lot of you all know, if you're using manual mode on your camera, it will only allow you to normally take an exposure length of something like 30 seconds before it maxes out. Putting your camera onto the B setting bulb mode allows you to surpass uh, that level of 30 seconds and take very long exposures that you can dictate, um, as I briefly touched upon earlier, using something like a cable release. Um, so build mode is the first thing that I want to make sure you guys um, understand you should be using for long exposures. Come on, let's come to the next slide. Well, there's something, isn't there? Here we go. Right. It's decided to wake up. Let's just go back a little bit. Okay. So here's my camera um, and the little digital remote that I use, um, quite a spangly one. Um, I'll just pause it, sorry. Um, quite a spangly little remote that I use for starting and stopping my exposures. I actually very rarely use this one anymore. Um, I did back when I shot this tutorial. Um, I like to use uh, really cheap um, cable releases now because they never they never, um, they never, never break and they're very reliable. These kind of uh, more uh, electronic battery operated systems that you can use for starting and stopping your exposures can go wrong, um, which can catch you short uh, sometimes when you're out on a night shoot. So, um, good news for everybody, I do actually recommend the cheaper kind of cable release ones that you just plug into the side of the camera. They're very reliable. But the reason I'm showing you this slide is just to kind of say, really, the sensible kind of working practice I always find is I, I'm, it makes me feel more comfortable before I head out on a, on a light painting shoot. I always check that, you know, I've got a fully charged battery, um, SD cards in there, and that the uh, the camera and the, the long exposure mode is working. So I'll always put it onto bulb mode, run a couple of test shots before I go anywhere to make sure that the cable release uh, or remote trigger devices is behaving itself. So here's my on location. Um, I love this spot. This is in Scotland next to uh, Loch Lomond. And these will be a bit more illustrative, these shots. So I'm standing there in the landscape as the light is just beginning to fade. It's just around sunset time. And I've got live view mode switched on in the back of my camera, which is helping me to compose my shot just before it gets dark. Um, and if it was completely dark, then I'd use my torch to illuminate the landscape to help me do that. Um, so I'm just setting setting the focal point. Uh, that comes next. Actually, I'm just setting the the the, uh, the shot up there. And then onto the shot, here's me setting the focal point. So if it's still bright enough, your camera may allow you to focus um, with what little ambient light is still around. But let's just pretend it's, it's much darker than this shot's actually showing because it normally will be when I'm out at night time working. I'll use that powerful torch I was telling you about earlier to illuminate the subject next to which I'm going to be light painting. And I'll use autofocus in the camera to help me set the focus. Uh, it normally goes beep, beep, or goes green. Tells me the focal point set on the area within the landscape. And I then switch autofocus back to manual focus. Now, that's a really important thing to remember to do, because by doing that, you have now locked in the focal point in the, within the landscape for your shoot. So you know the camera is not going to um, the focus isn't going to be thrown off the, the, when it when it comes to actually making making the final shot. We saw this just a brief moment ago. This is that kind of lightsaber tool I was talking about. And here it is, placed up next to a, a tree, and um, just getting ready to run a couple of test shots using this. And again, coming back to that kind of point I made earlier, making sure that your uh, your build mode or cable release is working. I'll run maybe a really brief test shot, just you know waving the tool around in the dark. Just to make sure, as you can see in that shot, that the um, the process is working okay. That I'm going to be capturing the light painting as I want to. And just to run through through with you guys, the idea I had uh, for the shot, which I think you saw at the very beginning of the presentation, funny enough, that, that Jay put up on the screen. Uh, the idea was I wanted to create a series of ribbons, colourful ribbons, running along the ground, um, in the foreground, just in front of that that lovely tree that sits next to the water. Um, and so, just before doing so. Again, coming back to the point I made earlier, I've always exposing for the landscape. You can see in the sky now, it's got pretty dark. Uh, the clouds have rolled in, and this is just a simple, single long exposure of the landscape itself, not doing anything, not tampering with it, 
just running a long exposure to the point where I was relatively happy with the length of the exposure, which in this instance, I believe was five minutes long, thereabouts. So not only do I now know the landscape is going to be catered for and exposed sufficiently, I also know, which is quite useful, I've got five minutes in which to make the work. Now, I very rarely use anything like that to make the light painting work. It's normally a minute or something like that maximum. So as I said to you a minute ago, the idea was I was going to basically walk back and forward, if you imagine, in the front of the shot, in front of the tree, moving the lightsaber device along the ground, up and down, creating a kind of wave-like action um, to create the light painting just in the foreground in front of the tree, which I'll show you next. And there it is. This is the kind of the final shot, I guess you'd call it. So I've walked back and forward, as you can see, maybe five or six times, moving the light source up and down. And hey, Presto, you've got light painting frozen into the shot. Uh, looks pretty surreal. Um, and again, captured using just a single long exposure. And another little tip as well, actually, it's quite useful to mention this while it pops into my head. I'll normally use some kind of marking system at the sides of the shots where the edge of the shots are. So I might use a white pebble or something like that in the ground, something, something that my eye is going to find quite obviously when it's, when it's a bit darker, to let me know where the boundaries of my shot line on either sides, because you don't want to be going way, way past the edge of your shot um, and out of shot for too long, just wasting, wasting energy and effort. I like to know roughly where the, where the, where the sides of the shot lie. So that, that kind of is something I do to help me. You may find that useful. And then I upload my images into Lightroom. I'm sure some of you already do something similar. And that's where I do all of my editing. Um, I, I very rarely do much in Lightroom. I'll maybe add a tiny bit of noise reduction just to reduce the noise levels ever so slightly if, if it's been a particularly dark night. Um, and I'll maybe straighten the horizon if I've got that slightly wrong. And I'll maybe, maybe slightly tweak the uh, saturation levels if I feel they, uh, they, need to be, they need to be slightly tweaked or dulled down. Um, I will never alter in terms of adding or removing anything from my, from my light painting images. As I said earlier, I quite enjoy the fact these things have been created organically in time and space. Okay, Jay, we're going to move on to uh, the next folder in just a few seconds, which is going to take you through a real broad kind of spectrum of light painting work that I've created. Um, any questions again at this point? No, let's do let's do that. Let's get the the, the last folder done, uh, Bird, and then any uh, I will ask everybody's questions. There's only there, there's a handful yeah. left. You covered most of them, but um, anybody okay. wants to stay online will just run over a little bit. I expect, but yeah, let's. Uh, I want to show off more of your images, mate. Sure. Okay. So here we go. Let me let me just make sure this slideshow is going to behave itself. We'll just pause it. Make sure it's doing what I want it to do, and it is. Okay. So we'll, I'll take you through, I think it's about 15 images now of different <clears throat> different kinds of light paintings that I've created over the last 10 plus years use, using different tools. Um, norm, normally within the landscape, I'll point out when they're not. Um, so again, this is going back to going back to Guernsey uh, when I lived there and driven by this, this need and this want to kind of um, represent the landscape in a completely different fashion to how others were capturing it. Um, so headed back out again, nighttime, you can see the moonlight on the water there. As I mentioned um, a bit earlier, I, I really enjoy light painting in conditions uh, when there's some ambient light around, so somewhere between a half moon and a full moon, um, I always find helps just kind of expose the landscape to a, to a nice level during, during the long exposure. Um, again, probably a five or six minute long shot, something like that. And I've used that time to walk to the, the far end of the image there at the back. And again, using that kind of quite simplistic lightsaber tool, I've just kind of run it along the ground, back and forward, and essentially coated the ground in, in light um, until I was right up to the, the tripod legs, and then switched off and waited for the rest of the exposure to, uh, to, to finish, to complete. It's quite a pretty image, this, isn't it? This, this one was created by my wife, actually. This is, the, this is the only other image in the collection that wasn't uh, created by myself. Funny, very funny story behind this one, very quickly. So this is the pretty much the first and only time my wife came light painting with me and had a really quick go using that lightsaber device and created this, this stunning image that I then subsequently um, uploaded online. And someone in Australia contacted me and used it for their album cover for a new CD they released. Um, so there we go. Don't don't take your, your pals or your wife light painting because uh, their work, work will get more credit than yours. Bit of a joke. Um, quite a cool story, actually. And again, using, using that same, same tool that I repeatedly have kind of shown you examples of, 
another nice thing that tool does actually, it's got a button on the side of it that you can press to freeze the color. So it kind of holds the color um, that you, you choose. Um, it kind of cycles through the seven different colors, but if, if you like the color blue, as I did in this particular night, I just froze it onto the blue color and try to kind of create and mimic this kind of wave action um, around these boys that were, were up on top of a, a field waiting to be re repainted, I believe. Um, so just trying to recreate the kind of motion of the sea on land. And again, I just wanted to show this image again, just to kind of, if you imagine me waving my arm around quite gently in, in the space as I walk through the shot, um, it really is as simple as that. And you can see the remnants of the sunset in the background. And coming back to that really interesting question someone asked um, quite early on this evening, you know, it, is, it, is it still quite bright sometimes when I go light painting? It's not overly bright, but what will happen um, during, for example, this shot you're looking at right now looks like it's kind of still kind of bright. Um, it's not though, it's much darker than that when I'm, st when I'm stood there. The, the nature of the long exposure is helping um, kind of bring up, if you like, those, those ambient light levels that are still there. So this is probably 30, 45 minutes after the, the sun had set and the, the nature of the long exposure is kind of exaggerating what little light was still left in the sky. So coming back to an example of a, a shot I kind of showed you a bit earlier, I, 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 I personally really like this image, only because it was a bit bit tougher to make, still fairly straightforward though. So coming back to this this idea of hanging a light from the ceiling and then setting it spinning, um, I did that and you can see that kind of blurred image in the background. That was me just setting the light spinning, but using, I think it was a bit of cellophane over the camera lens just to help blur uh, the effect of, of that nice kind of fine line that the physiogram creates. So I did one spin where I kind of blurred the camera lens and then did another spin where the light was just exposing straight into the lens without the use of cellophane or anything silly. And then those little butterflies were just created using a tiny little template of a butterfly. It was like a little toy that I had, but when I pressed the button on it, it was just battery operated. It just flashed, it flashed the little butterfly on and off. And I just walked around the space carefully in the dark, kind of placing roughly where I felt the butterfly should appear within the shot. And that bright light you see right in the center of the picture, that's just me switching my torch on off, on and off really quickly um, and aiming it directly into the camera lens to give that kind of starburst of light in the middle of the shot. So a few different things going on in that shot. And again, a single long exposure that I just kind of thought my way around in terms of how to order things and place things within the image. And here's another, another example of, of the very same kind of thing. So that looks like maybe three or four different spins of LEDs, just changing the color each time and, and then blurring the lens to create a kind of dappled, colorful background as well. You can do that in a dark garage or a dark room in your house if it's, if it's dark enough, pretty straightforward. If, if you want to look up any tutorials for physiograms, I can tell you right now, you'll find them on, I think probably, probably YouTube and also Flickr. I think there's some physiogram uh, example uh, tutorials on there if you want to go and have a look. This is, this, is a, this is one of my earliest light painting images. Um, if you remember that image I showed you quite early on of, of those wooden pillars in the sand that I kind of light painted around, this was right back then, maybe about 11, 12 years ago. And it's, it's, I always find this interesting. Whenever I get into any kind of new form of photography, some of the best ideas you'll have come quite early on. And I, I wanted to somehow light paint footsteps into an image that made it felt like someone was lit had literally been walking through the space. Um, I've always enjoyed this notion of, uh, behind light painting of, uh, you know, you're leaving behind remnants of light um, and not perhaps appearing yourself. So you're just leaving a trace of, of your time uh, and efforts within that space behind. And without getting too poetic, it's, it's kind of like, you know, how life works. You know, we, we arrive in the world and we leave a few small traces behind. And light painting, I feel, is, is kind of representational of the same. And so I wanted to create this kind of literal uh, effect of someone having walked through the space and this was created quite simply but um, although the, pro the problem solving at the time was a bit more complex I didn't really know how to create evenly spaced or evenly uh, drawn footsteps in the image and my wife said well why don't you just cut out templates of your shoes so I did that I just drew out cut out small shoe shaped uh, pieces of cards black cards and then hand drew around each one in the ground uh, using a small pen torch and then just moved repeatedly moved the card uh, down towards the water's edge uh, without falling in. Here we are 
back at Loch Lomond. I, do, I don't tend to add, add too many different um, effects to my light painting images. I'll either do an orb floating within the space because I find it quite sculptural. I love the form of it. Um, or I'll do some ribbons floating through the space. But in this particular occasion, I've done something a little bit different um, and I've, I've added both. Um, and you can see up in the sky there again, you can see the stars kind of beautifully expressing uh, the, the passing of time. And here we are back in that little kind of alcove chamber, fisherman's hut place. Um, we have spun a couple of orbs this time, two different uh, sizes to make it look like one is being encapsulated within the other. And then found that little butterfly tool um, in my tool bag and decided to flash that around the space um, to create this effect of, of a moth or a bunch of butterflies kind of being drawn to the light. And uh, I've either used a flash gun or I think it might have even been a torch on this occasion to to run around the brickwork um, within the image uh, just to kind of uh, illuminate the space in which I was working. And we looked at this image briefly earlier, two different orbs um, separately spaced within the landscape, this time adding some, uh, some reflection for extra effect and impact. And this one was up here in Scotland. Um, during a, a really interesting workshop that I taught uh, last last October, I think it was, and um, before all this craziness happened, um, I think this was for uh, what's that Devin Brown um, novel called, The Da Vinci Code. It, I think this is where part of that film uh, was was filmed on set, with Tom Hanks was chasing around uh, looking for things. Anyway, fascinating, fascinating place, and. A slightly different image, I guess, in, in the sense that, you know, I've got the, the orb structure that that kind of type of light painting indoors, which can work equally as well in, in certain spaces. Here we are, here we are again. I, I love walking next to the water. I'm sure you've kind of already got that, uh, but I love, I love it when reflections play, play a role in the, um, in the final light painting image. And you can just see that. I was going to call it nasty, but it's not nasty. It actually suits the image quite well. I think that light pollution being kicked up at the back of the image, that's Glasgow in the background, just uh, kind of spewing up some light pollution in the night sky. And here we're into a few, few of the final images, but using that bizarre tool I, I showed you earlier called the pixel stick, where you can actually upload specific images onto the, uh, the device and then light paint those those words, lettering, or, or images into, into the image itself. And if you like Star Wars, you'll, you'll, rec you'll recognize these, uh, these guys, the Atats. Again, I just thought it'd be really interesting to create a series of these walking through the space. Um, the pixel stick has a functionality where you can put onto repeat mode, so you can repeat the same image uh, time and time again. So I think I, I obviously added four of them by putting uh, the repeat mode on. Slightly more somber image. This is next to a, a World War II monument in Guernsey um, for the fallen soldiers. And again, using the pixel stick, managed to to light paint in the image. Quite a quite a stark a stark image within an image. And again, here's the, the pixel stick doing what it does best and adding rather crazy images into uh, <laughs> into the landscape. And that's us back to the. Uh, beginning of that series of images. So back to you, Jay. Do you have any more questions? Uh, yes, mate, we do. And uh, let's stick with this pixel stick, because we've had a few about that. And it uh, was one of the questions that I asked you the other day, actually, wasn't it? When, uh, mm -hmm. when we had our first conversation, being the Star Wars yeah. fan that I am. Um, so <laughs> am I right in guessing now, because you explained, obviously, and I was familiar with the pixel stick, as I said, I'd, I'd met, I think I'd met the guys who created it uh, a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. But so is that is that just like you were saying with the butterflies? Is that just flashing the saved image because they're so static and still, David? Is is, is there is that a short exposure that is in a flash of the graphic? Does that make sense? It's it's not just a flash of the graphic. So what it does is when you've uploaded the image into the pixel stick, it's it's got two hundred. I think I, I think I said this earlier. I'm not sure. Remind me, but it's got two hundred LEDs that run from top to bottom. And the idea is that it comes with a kind of handle behind that two meter long pole that attaches to the middle. So you're able to hold the stick, you know, perpendicular to the ground and walk, walk a lot, walk through the landscape, if you like, almost kind of dragging the, the, the pixel stick in front of you or to the side of you. 
And as long as you're aiming it directly at the, you know, towards the camera lens, what it does is it reads the image file that you've uploaded into it and the LEDs fire intermittent, intermittently. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this, this, this is quite an intelligent tool. When it's firing, it basically sends instruction to all the different LEDs along the face of the tool telling them what color to flash, how long for. So when you drag that, the pixel stick along, um, yeah, the image is created. Brilliant. I uh, love that. Um, just, there's some stuff here that, uh, guys, don't think I'm not going to ask uh, David your questions. I'm going to cover quite a few of them. But as David said at the beginning, as we said at the beginning, this is the first part. This is the introduction. So we're going to go a lot more into yeah. the te techniques next week, aren't we, David? We are indeed, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Um, right, what I'll do then, mate, is I'll just go down the question panel. They're not in any particular order, but we'll make sure we get the majority of them, uh, well, we get all of them asked that are appropriate. Um, okay. Okay. This was great. This came in quite early. So uh, some flattery, which is absolutely well-deserved, mate, but I love this. Um, so, David, great images. I've seen lots of your examples. I know a few people who've attended your courses, so they highly recommend you. So there's another there's an actual yeah. plug there rather than we have to talk about your courses. But we'll come <laughs> to that in a bit. Um, this chap, uh, Dave, is a crime – another Dave, uh, but, this, but Dave, he says he's a crime scene examiner, and they often use light mm -hmm. painting to, uh, constantly, although – uh, images aren't as attractive, he says. Um, I wonder if he wonders if you've ever um, experimented with sources like infrared and ultraviolet. In, infrared, no, I don't think I have to date. Um, ultraviolet is an interesting one. I remember I bought um, back in the earlier days of, of experimenting with all different kinds of tools. I bought a laser pointer that was infrared, um, lovely kind of purplish light that came out of it in the dark. And the weirdest thing was that during a long exposure, um, it was completely invisible in my final shots. Maybe he can help explain to me why that would be. There's probably a very logical reason for it. But I, I, I only found that red and, and green laser pointers, green especially, work really well. But the infrared one, uh, not the infrared one, sorry, um, it, it, just, it was completely invisible. There was nothing there. Okay. I, I, obviously, you don't know this. Uh, some of the audience yeah. might know this, but uh, my so my photography background, albeit my main background was videography, um, but my photography loves was live music. So um, I did a lot of that over the years. But um, mm -hmm. we were given an infrared camera by the company that um, repairs our cameras here at the studios, and they wanted me to try it out because they knew I was quite keen on landscape photography. Um, yeah. And they were looking. They were trying to persuade me to do some films on landscape photography with the infrared, convert into black and white to try and boost their conversion sales. Um, but I didn't like converting it to black and white. I liked the sort of the sepia and the tones that were coming out of, uh, you know, the actual conversion, the infrared conversion. So I ended up doing, it and they were they were thrilled with it. Um, but it took me a long time to grasp what colours were going to be affected by the infrared conversion. Um, and mm -hmm. so I go out to New York, which is obviously famous for its yellow taxis, and they just basically photograph as white. But once I mm -hmm. got used to that, and, and red as well, I can't remember, I think that's white or yellow or a yellowy tinge of white. Mm -hmm. So once you kind of learned that, so I guess there's something in the color spectrum. I'm only guessing, mate, and I'm trying to help you help you out there, but I don't know. Yeah, that, yeah. That's my, yeah. my infrared background, but uh, yeah, um, they can kind of... They've been trying to persuade me to do. A, I, well, I, I've sent my people. I keep going. We haven't seen your infrared stuff, yet. Jay. Please talk about it. So maybe, <laughs> maybe that'll come soon. Um, right. Let's get back to your questions. Enough about me. Um, color temperature. Is that a setting, David? Is there something you have to look at, or are we going to touch on that more next week? We, we probably won't go into much detail on that. Really, there's there's not much more for me to say on that other than I I tend to use auto white balance um, pretty much permanently. I very rarely change it unless I'm working in a which has only happened a few times, really, in a maybe a heavenly, a heav heavily street lit area, you know, where I might want to correct the um, the color temperature. But because I shoot in in raw format, if I ever need to change anything like that, I'll do so in Lightroom. Um, but I very rarely need to do so. Brilliant. Okay, mate. Cool. Um, this was asked a couple of times, and I know we're going to probably, uh, I know we're going into it in depth. But with the uh, with the globes, uh, a lot of people asked. Is it simply the light source being on a wire or a string and being spun around you? How do you get these perfect sort of globes? 
Well, um, there's a good incentive to tune in to, to number two next week because we will look at that. In, we will look at that in greater detail. It'd be a shame to give away everything tonight. Um, but the answer, the simple answer is no. It's not a string. Ah, okay, <laughs> right. Let's you know what. It's, it's, it's a it's a really good question because back back in the earlier days of light painting, about 12, 11, 12 years ago, the the orbs were they got really competitive. There was that guy in Australia I was talking to you about Dennis Smith. There was there was him. There were there were people in Canada, France, and Spain, I think, and we were all online together uploading our light paintings into various forums, um, and kind of the, the orb making got really competitive. So I went away and built myself my own device to to spin them, which I teach in my workshops now because I wanted to create my own system that gave me more control over how I spin the light. Um, and we will we'll look at that uh, next week. It, it wouldn't remain a secret, I promise. Let's, uh, let's keep them teased then and, and uh, poised to join us next <laughs> week. But I love it. Brilliant. Um, I guess this is quite a good question. And I guess uh, whether it's obvious or not, um, obviously weather, you've talked about a couple of times being outside at night and things like that. I guess yeah. in that wind and heavy wind is is a bit of a pain and, and a, is that a no or do you look at that when you get to your locations so even with the tripod I guess obviously if it's really windy it could affect the tripod right yeah it's, it's a massive consideration and on that particular image where I said I had to kind of wait through it, several hail, hailstone showers um that very rarely happens to me that was that that only happened that evening because it was our last chance to to go light painting on that Isle of Lewis um so we were simply at the mercy of the of whatever weather was was dished out that evening, but no, I always plan really carefully ahead. Um, again, we'll we'll look at that in a bit more detail in terms of why the the thought processes that I kind of go through before going on a light painting shoot. But the weather forecast is critical and really key to to planning any kind of outdoor shooting, especially at night time. Brilliant. Um... We had a couple of questions actually. We I don't obviously we haven't gone into it in depth and I'm sure we will next week. But are we looking at yeah. are we talking small apertures, David, to get the long exposures? Yeah, like you say, we'll kind of we'll, we'll deep dive into the more technical stuff next week. But yeah, in, in a nutshell, relatively wide aperture. So it will vary depending on the conditions that I'm working in on any given night. By ten my, my favorite aperture seems to be about five, five point six. That's the most common aperture that I would say I use and I use a relatively low ISO of 100 to 200. Brilliant. Um, we, I don't remember hearing you mention it at all. There's no filters involved in any of this photography, is there? No, never, never any filters, just uh, straight out the camera, straight out the lens. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, oh, somebody asked for a reminder and I couldn't remember what it was called, right? When you were showing the different light tools, right at the beginning of the tools, yeah. um, you showed the battery powered like wire that, uh, the, and obviously that, yeah. not the wire. So can you just remind us what that's called? Yeah, that's, you, you'll find it just by typing um, L wire. So E L, that's one word, L wire. Um, it's called electroluminescent wire. That's the full name. But I think if you just type L wire into Amazon, right. um, you, you'll find it on there or eBay. Um, I asked this one because we were asking about the pixel stick, which is brilliant. So I can get rid of a few of these. Um, oh. We've touched on the balls and the orbs. We're going to do that next week. Um, uh, a nice question here. Um, we, you, you talked about obviously the movement, but we didn't talk about the speed of the movement. Clearly, that obviously affects the effect in the light painting. It, it does indeed. Yeah, that's that's a, a very good point. So if I were to move too quickly. Well, it, it partly depends on the brightness of the tool that I'm using, of course, if you think of it that way. If I'm using a really bright tool to light paint with, I might actually want to move it much, much quicker because it will it will overexpose if I'm too slow with it. But for a lot of the tools that I use that are a bit a bit duller um, compared to the brightest ones I've got, I will move at a fairly steady speed through the um through the shot. So going back to that tool that I make the ribbons with. It's it's not that bright compared to some of the other tools, so I'll I'll move in a far slower kind of gliding fashion through the shot. It's almost a bit like a performance art when you see me making the work. Um, I just kind of gently, almost kind of like I'm conducting in the darkness with that tool. It's it's quite a nice one to use. But yeah, I, I move relatively smoothly in most instances. Um, although for the orbs, I spin the lights quite quickly, and a tool that we'll look at next week um, that are called light blades. Um, that we briefly saw earlier in that big tool picture that I showed you. Um, I move quite quickly with them as well. But yeah, generally speaking, fairly slowly. But it, yeah, the speed at which you move will directly impact the brightness and the saturation of the tool you're using. 
Uh, brilliant. Um, this was a good question. I thought, uh, David, I, you, you can't see it, so I better ask it to you. Um, obviously, we've seen your images tonight, basically mostly based around sort of uh, landscape and scenery. And obviously, you've showed us stuff, you know, in the dark in your homes. Um, have ever toyed yeah. with having uh, physical, you know, models in and painting around them? So I guess the question is like like a fashion style image, you know, more commercial type image. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something I'm going to be doing more work on soon, fun enough. Um, I, had, I had a very strong idea that I wanted to work on, <laughs> fun enough, before lockdown uh, kind of um, arrived. But no, I, I'm in touch with a few people, and a couple of them run dance schools or dance classes. And there's, a, there's an idea brewing that we'll use some of the dancers to either move around with the light painting tools to kind of capture the movement of dance and light, um, and also similar at the dancers themselves, you know. Um, of course, you could do that with anybody, doesn't need to be a dancer. Um, yeah. I don't do too much figurative work. I haven't done to date. But if you if you, if you you remove that kind of figurative element um, from, from my idea just for a brief second, when we look at another batch of work that I've made next week, um, I'll show you some very abstract light painting that doesn't involve any landscape. It just involves a blackout studio, so pitch black, and the light paintings themselves just on their own as sculptures. That gets quite interesting. Brilliant. So, uh, uh, you know, tell me if I'm completely off the mark here. So when we looked at that image that you mentioned with the uh, the hatch in the floor, the fisherman's cave, I love that image, by the way, yeah. uh, where, the, you know, you, I didn't, and, and I actually thought the, the light was coming from it. So it was interesting to see that you actually yeah. fed the light to the hatch. Uh, so where you said that, that you shot that over however long the exposure was, and then you flashed to highlight the room, in theory, yeah. so to answer this uh, Matthew's question, if say we had a model in the image, and you created yeah. your light painting, and then uh, speed light or whatever flashed her, we would get the same same or a desired effect. Does that make sense? Yeah, you can you can kind of flash freeze if you like people into the shot by using that that exact uh, yeah. process. Um, and I, I know people that regularly. Uh, light paint with individuals and, and models and so on in, in their photography. I know quite a few light painters that do that. So yes, absolutely possible. And I know several wedding photographers that have come in my workshops that now use light painting in their wedding photography. Brilliant. When it gets dark in the evenings, they light paint behind the, the happy couple. And yeah, it can be used. And so it's such a it's such a wonderful, wonderfully magical process. And it's it's very diverse. It can be used in a whole array of different ways. Sometimes with a bit of you know technical consideration to be made. But once you kind of relax a bit into light painting and you've kind of grasped the, the concept of the long exposure, it's just all about relaxing and having fun with it. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, we're getting there, mate. Just uh, actually one last question and then uh, yeah. <laughs> a shed load of praise, um, which uh, I, I will I'll feed back now in a second. Um, so the um, I'll read it as it sounds because it makes sense to me, but I won't try and get it wrong. Um, sure. So do you need to change the orientation um, in relation of the light trail to keep yourself from being in the shot. I think I've read that correctly. Let me just think about that. Can you explain what that means exactly? Yeah, so, so I'll just read it again. Um, do you need to change your orientation in relation to the light trail to make sure that you're not in shot? So I guess, I'm guessing. I think I know, yeah, I think I know what I'm guessing at. That's, that, that's a good question. Uh, Yes, at times, it depends on what tool I'm using, I guess. Uh, so if I'm using that kind of lightsaber tool or something to create ribbons with, I'll, I'll make sure the tool is pointed towards the camera and I'll be behind the tool, if that makes sense. So I'll be directing the tool towards the camera. Um, and when I'm spinning the orbs, I'm kind of in the middle of the orb, if that makes sense, because the way I'm spinning the lights around myself. Um, yeah, it all depends on the different the different tools that I'm using. Uh, so sometimes I'll be walking towards the camera, away from the camera. The tool is nearly always in front of me, though, because it needs to be presented towards the camera for it to be fully visible. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, because even um, it was interesting that obviously we chatted the other day, and I asked you the question uh, about the Atats being the Star Wars, oh, yeah. Star Wars geek that I am, and. Uh, fellow Nell is in absolute agreement with me tonight, saying that was uh, just genius. Love it. Uh, being a star, her words were being a being a fellow Star Wars nerd, genius. <laughs> so I didn't actually grasp, even though you explained it to me the other day when we were talking, that obviously mm -hmm. you are so that I'm the camera, 
then you've got the attack yeah. and you're actually behind the attack pointing it back towards the camera and that sank exactly. in completely to me and because yeah. then i realized why that um the the beach post or whatever it was you know actually cut through um the atta and the same with the uh the t-rexes exactly there. Yeah. yeah and and, and i did that quite intentionally to make to make it feel more convincing that those light paintings are within the space if you yeah. see what i mean it makes them yeah. more more three-dimensional that's the only downside to the pixel stick i will actually say this it, it, it does light paint these incredible images into the scene but they're two-dimensional because yeah. you're keeping the pixel stick straight and they're quite flat so unless you're really throwing that pixel stick around and moving it around quite physically um, just with colours on it, then you're just going to light paint a, a fairly flat image into the shot, which is a bit of a shame, but it's also very cool. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, look, mate, we uh, that's all of the questions. I have got a page full of praise, honestly. Uh, oh, loving okay. it. Uh, and people already saying looking forward to next week for more in-depth on that. Um, <laughs> and we've run over, but so many of them have stayed with us, which is brilliant. Uh, we, we've got to say, obviously, look, you know, uh, this is a full on plug now for David. His ebooks are already available to you guys. So, you know, the links are in the panel. You'll get them from us tomorrow. You'll find them on our Facebook. Actually, the post will be live by now. So you can find on the Photographer Academy Facebook and you can uh, have this step by step guide to light painting tonight. Of course, you can join us next Wednesday and ask you all the questions about it. And then is insight also into um, uh, your amazing macro photography, which uh, we're going to do in a few weeks' time. Obviously, or we know we need a bit of a gap for you because you've got stuff going on. Yeah. But uh, we, we thought it was important that we didn't break up these two when we realised that the light painting was going to cover two. We wanted to keep them um, back back to back. Sure. Um, but yeah, the praise is is thoroughly coming through. So you know, hook up with David on Facebook and Instagram. Use our links to, to find his ebooks. And of course, you've mentioned it several times. I know we're sort of looking at the new environment, but you know, I don't think it's long before you'll be able to get some workshops up and running again, David. You know, within yeah, uh, yeah, I'm already I'm already kind of on it. The the, the blackout studio that I use um, for a lot of my physical workshops and my teachings is available to me again from October, I believe. And um, we'll just have to wait and see how it goes. But but yeah, the, the workshops. If, if anyone really wants to take the plunge and immerse themselves into this magical world, then let me know if you want to join one day because uh, they're pretty special. Mate, I'm coming up. I'm definitely coming up. So <laughs> uh, my holidays plans this year have been completely screwed. Um, and I love Scotland yeah. and I've got friends there. Uh, and obviously now I need to meet you. So I've never done it, uh, but you've you've got me intrigued. And uh, yeah, I want to, I'll come up and do it. And I'd say we could do some film, but you're clearly going to get to work in the dark. So video is kind of be <laughs> I've once got asked well, somebody asked me once to uh for the academy to make a film on uh, the live music photography and the videographer came with me and I said you're not going to get anything mate he said yeah I'll be fine I said, you won't get anything and then he realized what was on because yeah. the lights went out and he's literally just got some flashing lights of the band on the stage <laughs> and unfortunately yeah, yeah. You know, it was just like but uh, no I'm I'm there mate as soon as we can get that to happen I'm going to definitely come and visit I'm I I will, t I will, t I will maybe, maybe the safest way for me to reapproach these workshops to start with certainly will be to take people light painting outdoors and that's, yeah, uh, sure. that's, that's even more magical when that happens so it might be a good thing. Yeah, brilliant. Well, look, it's there. So get, you know, sign up for David's uh, newsletter through his site, uh, check out his ebooks and of course, join us next Wednesday. So it will be Wednesday next week, uh, same time though, seven o'clock. Yeah. Um, and again, you can find all the registration links from the Facebook Photographer Academy. And of course, our e-blast will be going out a bit nearer the time. Uh, David, may have had a blast. I've really enjoyed it. And so have the people uh, online with us. So, um, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Really happy to hear that. Excellent. No, it's been really, really good. Uh, guys, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for sticking with us. So many of you did. Um, and it's, you know, it's great first kickoff of the new series. You did it with a bang, mate. So thank you for that. Um, really, really thank good. You. So now everybody else got to live up to your standards, mate. Um, <laughs> so if you want to check out uh, David's articles that he's done for us in the free academy e-zine, then um, this is uh, two issues ago, but still available for you to download where he's featured there with his macro photography. As we said, the new issue's gone live today with an article on his uh, light and painting in there as well. And I know that uh, he's, he's, he's hooked now, I've got him. So we will definitely use him <laughs> a lot more going, going forward on that. Um, and get involved with us. So let's see your images in there and your light painting. So get involved with us on Instagram. Um, let's, you know, show us what you guys are doing and what you've taken away from this. So at TPA photo or hashtag at TPA photo, 
and then we'll have a look at those each month and try and get some of those featured in uh, the magazine. And if you do want to upgrade your Academy membership um, using it to the pro level and say 40 quid, simply use that code PRO59. And as we said, join us next Wednesday, the 2nd of September at 7 uh, for the uh, more in-depth guide into the techniques with David. Thank you, mate. Really, really enjoyed that. Thanks for sticking with us. Thanks, everybody, for sticking with us. My pleasure. Thanks, uh, everyone.